Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission briefing on the human rights situation in Pakistan. My name is Tariq Ahmed, and I'm a foreign law specialist at the Law Library of Congress, focusing on South Asia. It is my honor to moderate today's discussion titled Human Rights in Pakistan. We're privileged to have with us two distinguished experts on Pakistan, one specializing in the legal and judicial fields and the other in public policy and journalism. Together, we will explore the evolving human rights conditions in the country following the February 2024 national elections amidst ongoing economic, political, and security challenges in the country. Since the national elections, which have been marred by allegations of electoral irregularities by the Pakistan Tahrik Insaf PTI, the political party led by former Prime Minister Imran Khan, both international and local human rights groups have raised serious concerns about an increased crackdown on political dissent, escalating restrictions on freedom of expression and the press and worsening situation for ethnic communities and religious minorities. Despite some recent judicial victories, including relief and acquittals in certain uh, cases like the political gifts case, the marriage nikah case, and of course the reserve seats case, Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan remains imprisoned due to ongoing cases related to political corruption, incitement to violence by protesters, among other charges. He and his party describe the charges and convictions against him as politically motivated. Reports indicate that restrictions on the right to political assembly and the targeting of political leaders and workers, particularly those associated with Imran Khan's party, have persisted. This crackdown reached a peak in July when the government announced its decision to ban PTI and pursue treason charges against Imran Khan. The Pakistani government has justified its actions by citing allegations against Khan and his party, including inciting violent protests, leaking classified information, receiving foreign funding, and engaging in corrupt practices. The government asserts that these, some of these actions pose a threat to national security and public order. In addition, the curtailment of freedom of ex expression and press freedom has intensified. Journalists and civil society organizations are facing increasing threats arrests under anti-terrorism laws and sedition laws, as well as the misuse of the Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act. While this law ostensibly used to combat cyber crimes, it has also been employed to silence dissent and censor online content. Regulatory bodies such as the Pakistan Telecommunication Authority and the Pakistan Electronic Media Regulatory Authority continue to restrict online content, enforce internet shutdowns and censor media outlets. Since the February elections, access to social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, has been blocked and there's growing concern about the rumored implementation of a national firewall to monitor and regulate internet content and social media platforms. This has reportedly led to significant internet disruptions and financial losses for businesses across the country. The government defends many of these measures by citing national security concerns, fighting misinformation, and the need to prevent incitement of political violence. In regions like Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan, which are experiencing heightened insecurity and militancy, there has been a violent crackdown also on peaceful protest movements representing marginalized ethnic communities. In, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, the protest movement is largely in response to the government's heavy-handed approach to combating terrorism and militancy in, re in the region, uh, govern governance issues, and amongst other feelings of marginalization and disaffection. Meanwhile, in Balochistan, it stems from grievances over exploitation of natural resources and demands for accountability um, concerning enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings allegedly committed by security and military forces. Finally, as highlighted by Amnesty International and other human rights groups, there has been a disturbing escalation in attacks and arrests targeting religious minorities, particularly the Ahmadi Muslim community. This community has been constitutionally declared non-Muslim and, le and legally barred from referring to themselves as Muslims and has faced arrests for performing religious rites such as animal sacrifice during Eid festival. Their mosque, heritage sites, and cemeteries have also been subject to continuous attacks. Mob-related blasphemy incidents have also remained a grave concern. Um, for example, Amnesty, Amnesty International reports that in May 2024, a Christian man was lynched and his factory was set on fire in Sargoda, Punjab, after being accused of burning pages of the Holy Quran. In June 2024, a 36-year-old Muslim man was burned to death by a mob in Sawat, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, over similar allegations. 
So today our two panelists will brief us on these and other important issues. Each panelist will present their remarks and we hope to have some time uh, for the questions at the end. And you can put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, so um, before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce our distinguished panelists and share their backgrounds. Uh, Dr. Wadis Hassan is a junk professor of law at Howard University School of Law and Human Rights Practitioner. Dr. Hassan previously served as a policy analyst for South Asia at the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. Dr. Hassan received his SJD degree from American University Washington College of Law in 2017, specializing in constitutional and comparative law. His dissertation focused on the development of judicial review in the Supreme Courts of Pakistan, India, and the United States. Dr. Hassan received his JD from Howard University of Law in 2011 and his LLM from American University of Law, specializing in international human rights and international business uh, in 2013. And Reza Rumi is a policy analyst, journalist, and author. He is a distinguished lecturer in human rights at Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, New York. He is also a visiting faculty member at the Brooks School of Public Policy at Cornell University. From 20, 2015 to 2023, Mr. Rumi taught at Ithaca College, where he also served as the director of Park Center for Independ Independent Media. In 2016, he was a visiting faculty at New York University. Mr. Rumi has been a fellow at the New America Foundation, United States Institute of Peace, and the National Endowment for Democracy. He's also a member of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics at Georgetown University. Before moving to the United States, he is headed, he headed think tanks and nonprofits in Pakistan and worked in the broadcast media. His foray into public prayers came after working as an officer of the Pakistan Administrative Service, the United Nations Mission in Kosovo, and the Asian Development Bank. Uh, Dr. Hassan, if you can begin, please. Sure. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, thank you to the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission for hosting this important discussion today. The struggle for human rights in Pakistan has played out in the streets during protests, in the voting booth during elections, and in the courtrooms, which is where I will focus my comments mostly today. While there have been flows of democratic rule and judicial protection of rights throughout the country's history, there have been considerable ebbs which have challenged the long-term growth of democratic institution and constitutional rights. The most recent example of the weakening of these institutions, as Static mentioned, uh, and, and these rights that I'm discussing, happened during the 2024 general elections, which many commented were the least free elections in recent history, some calling them selections, and other calling them the general's elections. These euphemisms were used because, the control, because of the control the military allegedly exerted in the lead-up and the execution of the elections in Pakistan. One of the major ways that the military has allegedly exerted um, its control in the lead up of those elections was through its um, impact on the judiciary in Pakistan and the pressure that's been applied in the courts by the military. The courts have disqualified several prime ministers since 2012. And for Mr. Khan, while the establishment had previously seemingly supported his rise to the prime minister's seat in 2018, their support for him waned during the course of his leadership. Accordingly, in the lead up to the elections in 2024, several steps were taken, which many attributed to the military's influence over democratic institutions in the country, including the judiciary. For example, Khan and his supporters were imprisoned and charged under dozens of criminal and civil complaints, which are all being handled by the judiciary, including the lower courts and the Supreme Court. Additionally, in a country where um, excuse me, in a country where illiteracy is still relatively high, the symbol of a political party on ballots is incredibly important. During the lead up to the 2024 elections, the Supreme Court upheld the Electoral Commission's decision to ban Imran Khan's party, the PTI, Pakistan Tariq e Insaf, from using the cricket bat as a symbol on their ballots. This essentially forced PTI party members to run as independents using various symbols on ballots rather than as members of one unified party. All of this happened under a larger shadow during the elections wherein the establishment was accused of threatening politicians and judges alike. While this trend has existed throughout Pakistan's history, it was on full display from 2023 to 2024 as several politicians associated with Khan withdrew from his party, allegedly due to threats from the establishment and exposure to criminal liability. Additionally, several high court judges filed a petition before the Supreme Court asserting that they had faced intimidation by agents claiming to be associated with the establishment. 
Based on some of these findings, it is not difficult to see that the pendulum of judicial power in Pakistan has swung in some ways against the preservation of constitutional rights in favor of pacifying the military's demands. But this is not to imply that the court hasn't taken bold stances in the protection of rights in the recent past. The court made recent decisions concerning the rights of religious minorities, the rights of civilians not to be tried by military courts, and the rights of Imran Khan's party to take certain parliamentary seats that they were legally entitled to. Yet, in the case of the religious freedoms and the civilians being tried by military courts, the Supreme Court subsequently walked back both decisions, either to placate religious parties or placate the military respectively. Furthermore, several important constitutional and international legal rights continue to face serious challenges in Pakistan. In regard to the freedom of press throughout all recent administration, including Khans himself, journalists have faced everything from contempt of court charges for publishing content critical of the court to sedition and terrorism allegations and retribution for their exercise of the freedom of press. Additionally, criminal cases targeting political party activists have also been used recently, but date back several decades and stand in contravention of the right to freedom of association and democratic principles generally. Lastly, the right to freedom of religion or belief has also faced setback after setback in Pakistan in the form of mob attacks, criminal allegations of blasphemy against minority religious groups, including Christians, Hindus, and Amadis. Regardless of which constitutional and international legal right we discuss, the strengthening of political and judicial civilian institutions as guarantors of the rights of democracy will only will be the only way to course correct in Pakistan. The U.S. government has historically dealt directly with the Pakistani military to ensure maximum effectiveness in a challenging bilateral relationship. Yet, this has impacted the imbalance of power between civilians and the military, granting increased legitimacy and power to the military at the cost of the development of democratic institutions, including parliament and the courts. Therefore, it is imperative for people in this room, I believe, to advocate for three things. First, the U.S. government should engage more directly with their civilian counterparts on a regular basis. Second, they invest greater resources in strengthening the rule of law in Pakistan. And third, fostering a protection of constitution constitutional rights and values that the U.S. and Pakistan both share for its respective citizenry. Without these judicial and political institutions gaining their independence, all individuals and all political parties face a legal sword of Damocles, which will fall on their necks as it has for almost every figure that gained enough public support to threaten the establishment in the past. Yesterday, it was the Pakistan People's Party. Today, it is Imran Khan and the PTI, but tomorrow it could be others. Thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions from the panel at the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Waris. Uh, Reza, please. Uh, you're muted, Reza. Thank you so much, uh, Waris and Reza, for those uh, very insightful uh, uh, introductory remarks. Uh, let's jump into some questions. Um, let's start with uh, the crackdown on political dissent and Imran Khan. Now, both uh, Imran Khan and Shabazz Sharif governments have been described as, you know, quote unquote, hybrid regimes where a civilian leadership operates under the influence of very powerful military establishment. If the human rights situation has worsened uh, and the and there's been a even furthering of crackdown on political dissent under Shabaj Sharif's uh, government compared to the previous administration. Has it worsened? And if so, what are the factors that contribute to this escalation despite seemingly similar power dynamics? Reza, do you want to start on that? Okay. I mean, I think I think Varis uh, uh, very eloquently, uh, you know, summarized. Uh, what was going on, I think the dynamic here really is the, uh, you know, the ironical situation because uh, as uh, Waris highlighted, Imran Khan was uh, favored and brought in by the military in 2018. And prior to uh, those years, you know, there was sub substantive uh, investment in, uh, uh, in, in, in building his image, etc. Uh, but, you know, once he was in power, and that has been the case with most civilian prime ministers, uh, they uh, enter into a conflict with the military because the military ca calls the shots in Pakistan. And any civilian prime minister, so Imran Khan was just being uh, 
uh, a what a prime minister is supposed to do uh, lead the country you know lead its foreign policy economic policy domestic policy and exercise power and he fell out with the military chief and uh, then there was a vote of no confidence in 2022 uh, which was obviously underwritten by the military uh, and uh, resulting in the ouster uh, in, in Imran Khan's ouster. Uh, but what we have seen in the recent years is that, you know, his large support base in Pakistan and abroad here in the US as well has mobilized, uh, you know, and uh, one has to really uh, kind of give a lot of um, credit uh, to those uh, who have uh, supported his cause and are, are still continuing uh, to support his cause in highlighting this uh, issue of civilian supremacy in Pakistan, because that is fundamental uh, to the operation of Pakistani constitution and guarding of uh, human rights. And so what has happened in the, in the process in the last two years is that the military has lost a lot of ground and public support because they are now witnessing that yet another prime minister, yet another political party is under immense uh, threat by uh, the police, by the intelligence agencies, by other, uh, you know, tactics which have been historically used, uh, including the manipulation of election in February 2024. So I guess that has uh, led to this dynamic uh, where you have increased polarization within Pakistani society and political um, uh, sort of landscape. And I think what is now really urgently needed is that, you know, the, the temperature goes down and perhaps, uh, you know, allies and friends of Pakistan, like the, U like the US uh, and UK and other European countries need to have private diplomatic engagement uh, with the government, uh, urging them to respect some of the democratic freedoms, because I mean, hell, heavens will not fall if Imran Khan comes out of jail, or even his even if his party comes into power, uh, you know, nothing is going to change. But it is just that you know the uh, the the degree of conflict uh, between the establishment and Imran Khan has really reached a peak, and that's why we are seeing this particular uh, instability. But if I could just add, I think Reza yeah. beautifully put it all. I think there's no better way to say it. But I think that one of the things that I envision <clears throat> is that the constitutionally mandated, like, sort of duties of any prime minister put them inherently on a crash course of the military. So it, it wouldn't matter, right, uh, who it would be filling that slot. If, if it was Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, right, if it was Benazir Bhutto, if it was uh, Imran Khan, all of them, if they do their job as it's designated to them in the Constitution, will at some point come into a crash course with the military's interests. And at that point, the question remains, are the institutions that are civilian strong enough to be able to persist in those moments of conflict? What we've seen is that in comparison to the military's power, no, they aren't. And consistently we see, um, again, this crash course that happens, that if you have enough sufficient public support to threaten the establishment, the establishment will bring you down in some way, shape or form. Now before, you know, they used to have like specific coup brigades, like the 111 Brigade, they would, you know, deploy them and there would essentially be a military coup in the country. And I think what I would argue now is that instead of that, you know, there are other institutions inside of the de democratic sort of formula that are used by the establishment in order to accomplish their ends. And one of those, unfortunately, has been at least in the last, um, I guess we could say 15 years, uh, 12 years or so, has been the judiciary, right? That there's been a disqualification of almost every sitting prime minister. Um, and fascinatingly enough, the lead petitioner and whoever is trying to bring down the prime minister uh, in the Supreme Court is then this then becomes prime minister themselves and becomes disqualified. So there's a poison pill almost because when it was uh, Yusuf Raza Gilani, who was disqualified in 2012, the lead petitioner was Nawaz Sharif. Nawaz Sharif then comes into power and has a petition lined up by Imran Khan, and then he is taken out. And now Imran Khan led that, led that petition, and now he was removed. So there's almost this perpetual cycle that's happening um, that I think in many ways the military, is, the establishment is the beneficiary of, that there's an imbalance of power between civilians um, inherently as written in the con constitution with these sort of unwritten and un sort of said rules that relate to military, um, the establishment's interests, and they become on a crash course such that the civilians are always going to be in, in sort of like 
reconstruction mode at some point because whoever is their leader is going to be deposed in some way whether it's through judiciary or through other manners um and then they'll have to start again from scratch so that's why we're seeing i think a lot of these institutions as reza mentioned in his uh comments that there is no continuity there's no fluidity between one administration to the next so these institutions can't strengthen themselves um and that's to the benefit of i think the establishment that they don't do that and that's the perpetual cycle we're stuck in so um yeah just to build off of what reza was saying i think that's where we are so does are the other political elites learning any lessons from this i mean from what you guys are uh, uh, implying is that sometimes human rights uh, among the political elites at least is 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 a discourse that is being weaponized when you're out of power when you become the the victim so what does that suggest for the political parties right now in terms particularly the PTI are they, have they learned their lesson are they taking human rights more seriously or is it just uh, similar to discourse, discourse of the victim, basically, uh, weaponizing uh, human rights in that particular context. And if they were in the future to come back in power, they would probably do the same thing. Or have they learned any lessons? <laughs> I, yeah, Razal, yeah. defer to you. I think you're a better... Uh, uh, no, no, no. I think, I think Tariq, that, that's a million dollar question. And I, and if I had an answer, I would, I would certainly <laughs> charge a million dollars. Well, I mean, I think Varis has already mentioned how Nawaz Sharif in the past, you know, uh, in the 1990s, some of us grew in that environment where we saw the late Benazir Bhutto and uh, Nawaz Sharif, you know, uh, um, trying to bring the, each of those governments down. That trend, unfortunately, is back. And one of the key uh, key problems in Pakistan is that there's no civilian consensus on basic issues like a fair election, uh, independent election commission, safeguarding of human rights, uh, not mistreating and jailing your political opponents. I think that that consensus is missing. And this is why, uh, you know, a lot of uh, critics of Imran Khan uh, say, you know, because in uh, during Imran Khan's uh, tenure as prime minister from 2018 to early 2022, uh, you know, there were numerous uh, reports of human rights violations and squeezing of media freedoms. In fact, all, almost all of uh, the political opponents of uh, the then regime were jailed, including Nawaz Sharif, you know, the former prime minister, the current president Zardari was also in jail for many months. The current prime minister, Shavar Sharif, was in uh, was uh, locked up, I think, twice, uh, totaling uh, 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 the length of two years. And you see, so what happens is that when the opponents get power, they say, OK, this is my time to settle the score. You jail me, now I'm going to do that to you. Now, what you say, what guarantee is there that when Mr. Khan comes out, and Mr. Khan is so popular at the moment that, you know, in the next election uh, and with the public pressure, uh, he, you know, he he's likely to come back to power, well, you know, if and when the a fair, a, a fair election happens. And so... It, his resolve would be really tested if he uh, changes his own uh, political track and uh, sets a new precedent. Uh, unfortunately, in Pakistan's history, there are very few examples where this has happened. There was one example in 2006, all political parties signed something that was called the Charter of Democracy, where major political parties sat down and said, we will not let the establishment interfere in the political governance. We would keep them out of power. We would amend the constitution, blah, blah, blah. And they did uh, implement it to some degree. And then it also fell out. They both violated the Pakistan People's Party and the and Nawaz Sharif's party. But now what we need in Pakistan is a larger, broader uh, charter of democracy that includes Mr. Imran Khan and his party. And they all... Uh, agree on certain basic rules of the game. And, uh, you know, I hope, I hope that you, what you said happens to be the case, that, you know, uh, things change. Um, I just cited history because that's something we can always refer to as facts. Thank you. Waris, I have a question for you, uh, um, uh, focusing more on the judicial independence. Now, uh, as we've also we've noted and we noted in your remarks that in the past we've seen contradiction in terms of who 
the court and the judiciary supports or challenges depending on who's under political favor of the military. And then there are sporadic moments uh, where the judiciary tries to reassert itself, its independence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the military establishment. Uh, in the context of the current hybrid regimes where the military establishment is trying to reassert power post Imran Khan, how will the court try to balance its own survival while trying to maintain its independence uh, and judicial credibility? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's another, I mean, it's a million dollar question that's being asked probably in the corridors of the Supreme Court every day. Um, how do we ensure our safety while ensuring our legitimacy, which has come under a, a real serious, um, you know, the, the serious level of attack, which I don't think has been seen since the lawyers movement in 2007 and 2008. Um, you know, that's where the apex, I think, of the public support of the judiciary was uh, once they were fighting against the Musharraf regime and the lawyers were really at the forefront of a democratic uh, movement. That was, I think, the height of their sort of both power in many ways, but also their public support. And since then, it's waned quite a bit. Um, unfortunately, in some ways, it's sort of a catch-22, right? They need to feel public support to feel bolstered enough to be able to challenge certain establishment interests, etc. Um, but if they don't have that support, then it's oftentimes more easy for them to go along with the military's or the establishment's sort of requests, in which case their legitimacy falls even more. So it's almost a self-perpetuating cycle, um, which is hard to hard to break. I think two examples that I'll give are the ones that actually you, you mentioned, uh, Tariq, in your opening uh, comments. One of them, uh, both of them relate to an assertion of power by the Supreme Court and then a subsequent walking back, right? Uh, so you have the Sani case uh, as it relates to the Ahmadi Muslim community and it related to a, a, you know, a pretty relatively progressive judgment, I think, from the Supreme Court um, in many ways. But then uh, there were allegations made against the Chief Justice. There were threats of, you know, protest and violence by religious parties. And subsequent to that, the court, despite trying to stake out its independence through its judgment, um, which it did do with, with one judgment, then walked it back with another judgment, right? Um, so we see that they're trying to push forward, but then when they see the public reaction, uh, potentially in the, in the sort of, yeah, the, the pushback that may come, they'll walk back their decision, right? In a similar way, uh, we had the military trial issue, which is, I think Raza has exactly put it correctly, that it's still un, it's still sub judice. So it's, we haven't come up with a final decision yet. But at one point, the Supreme Court had said, you know, these military trials or, you know, trials run by the military can't be, um, you know, uh, assessing the guilt or passing judgment on civilians. Civilians aren't military officials, so they can't be tried by military courts, right? Um, and then subsequent to that, you know, there was allegations, and I think there was at least um, undisclosed allegations that, you know, certain pressures were being applied on the judiciary uh, by the establishment to say that this is not the judgment that we want to have finally. So then the court comes back, and then it changes its judgment again and says, well, we're going to suspend our previous judgment and we're going to allow for military tribunals to continue trying civilians potentially, but we're going to still leave certain technical legal questions open to assess down the, down the road. So you see that there's like this an assertion, like right, of judicial independence, of a preservation of uh, rights for citizens. And at the same time, when they see a backlash or public sort of outcry in response to it or an outcry by the establishment, they walk back their decision. So I think that's what we're seeing now. If these same decisions decisions were before the court in maybe 10 years ago, I don't think they would probably walk them back, right? I think they would have probably just said, this is what our jurisprudence says, because we have enough public support to back up any kind of threats we may face. But now they feel, I think, in many instances, particularly because Imran Khan and, and his party um, have been subject to so many criminal trials and cases that they've questioned the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, that now the Supreme Court is in this self-perpetuating cycle, and the judiciary generally is in a self-perpetuating cycle, where because they lack public support, it's harder for them to push back on the establishment or on other interests. So it's kind of a difficult position for them to be in. But the point is, I think, that they do lack a lot of public uh, support and credibility, and that does impede their desire and their ability to actually try and confront some of these sensitive issues in a more independent fashion. Thank you so much, Varis. Do you want to add anything, Raza? Yeah, I mean, just a quick comment. I think Varis has really uh, elaborated uh, rather well. Let me also add that, you know, the role of Pakistan's judiciary has been far from glorious throughout its history. And that's an unfortunate reality. You know, we were talking about the politicians and we were talking about the military. But one of the key instruments 
uh, with the military dictators in Pakistan or authoritarian civilian leaders has been that the judges and the judiciary, uh, you know, has been an active participant in uh, undermining human rights, citizen freedoms, and even some constitutional guarantees. And I think that is something that is that we need to remember when we talk about judicial independence. However, this time what we are seeing is a pushback from some of the judges in Islamabad High Court, uh, some of them in the Supreme Court of Pakistan, that are saying enough is enough. You know, don't arm twist us to that extent that, you know, we've already lost so much credibility. And, you know, that is directly in response to your question, Tariq, that the judges are very concerned about their credibility and how the public views them at the moment. And part of it has also to do with the pressure that builds through social media, uh, through digital spaces. Earlier, the media environments were fully controlled. Uh, the new development in Pakistani political a landscape is that the social media is is not fully controllable despite all the clamp down on x and this and that uh the judges do see what the public reactions are and so they're trying to negotiate and navigate that particular uh you know the pressure from the establishment and their own zeal to guard their independence and Tarek, just to mention, there's a couple questions in the webinar. Yeah, in the follow-up. Let me let me let me read them out. Um, so we have one follow-up question for you, Aris. If the prime minister's constitutional responsibilities are in direct conflict with with the powers of the military, where does the power of the military derive from? Is that also written into the constitution, or is it de facto? And then there's another follow-up question: Does the military frame its support for trying a civilians as necessary for counterterrorism? If so, is the U.S. giving the Pakistani military a pass on inappropriate counterterrorism mechanisms. Yeah, so I'll just read, uh, you know, being the lawyer in the room, I have to just read part of the constitution, right? And that gives my answer. It's very easy and clear. And I think Raza, when he hears this quote, will probably smile. Um, Article 245, the armed forces shall, under the directions of the federal government, defend Pakistan against external aggression, the threat of war, subject to law, act in the aid of civilian power when called upon doing so. That's the power of the military as stated by the constitution. Um, what the de facto power is, is far, far greater than that, right? And in fact, you could rewrite so many parts of that. You know, as a lawyer, I'm, I'm thinking like, how does this work practically? And I could change almost 70% of that last article to actually demonstrate what the actual sort of de facto sort of rule is that in fact the military is the one that's um directing the federal government in many ways and so uh the constitution is pretty clear i mean there are definitely rights that the uh, military has um that are unique in this constitution versus others but that's what the general job description is and i think it, their actual power far outsizes that um right so that's i think my answer there that it's not constitutional necessarily it's definitely more de facto and it's been kind of recognized by the power stakeholders throughout the country that this is what the issue is um, when it comes to the CT issue, I don't think that like, I mean, really the, the military, um, the, this is a long running issue. And I think Reza can talk a little bit more about the history of this, but military courts in Pakistan are definitely not a new thing. Um, and this set of military courts came through a set of amendments to the constitution, as well as to changes in the law of the military act that have been sort of debated and discussed over the last, I think, seven or eight years or so. Um, and there's a sunset clause where in the law itself, there was supposed to be an end of military trials, um, but then those kept getting pushed back. It was, and it was a response mostly to um, terrorism operations that were happening inside of Pakistan at the time when that sort of law was passed that essentially like, you know, a lot of terrorists are committing acts of violence against Pakistani citizens and to fast track trials because the civilian courts are a little bit backed up and they don't have a high prosecution rate, we're going to have military trials instead. Now, the new iteration of this seems to be that really the military trials are being used against civilians who are members of the PTI or members of the, the opposition party now, at least uh, at the head. So I don't think that the justification being given for this set of prosecutions is necessarily CT or counterterrorism generally, but I think the origination of these military tribunals and even their extension of jurisdiction over civilians was a matter of this is a counterterrorism issue. So in some ways, the 
origin perhaps does relate to what the U.S. and other international stakeholders would consider as, you know, important CT issues, both globally and for Pakistan. But what it's being used now for, it seems to be more political um, retribution against those who were standing against the military's interest in this last election, um, which then it would be a potential violation of both international standards from FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, from the U.S. government, from the EU, uh, the U.N., all of those bodies would likely say that that's not the proper use of CT, um, counterterrorism laws and counterterrorism infrastructure internationally. Uh, before I move on to questions regarding um, uh, internet shutdowns, freedom of expression, and religious freedom, I just want to read out one question from the audience. Uh, Pakistan Army has supported so has support of U.S. administration. U.S. House of Representatives has passed H.R. 901, demanding many corrective actions, but the Army hasn't done anything as the U.S. administration has not asked for asked for to, to take any corrective measures. What's next steps for the Pakistani diaspora? Hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. I, um, well, I, I can. I think uh, the uh, the reality is that the Pakistan has been a long-standing ally and a recipient of military and economic aid by the United States. But what we have also witnessed is that a, a, a dramatic decline in both the military and economic aid. So some of the traditional levers that the U.S. administration had over Pakistan or other countries uh, uh, are simply not there, right? So yes, there's indirect uh, uh, influence uh, that a lot of Pakistanis claim that uh, the US can uh, influence the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. You know, I think some of these uh, um, demands were also articulated by members of Pakistani diaspora, but that is not a direct governmental uh, role. It is by proxy or very indirect, very far-fetched. So in that sense, the levers are not there. So so a lot of, uh, I mean, the Congress passed this uh, historic re resolution on Pakistani elections and the human rights violations. But I think there's more, there's room definitely for more diplomatic engagement uh, to begin with. And then, you know, like the commission that Varis has worked uh, for in the past uh, with, you know, fact-finding uh, missions, uh, you know, either through the the government uh, governmental agencies or through non governmental civil society uh, you know uh, commissions I think that is something that perhaps uh, needs to be done in the short term uh, but I think consistent application of consistent pressure or or at least dialogue will help uh, you know uh, quell these rights situation. Having said that, I think. I am one of those persons uh, who think that uh, external or foreign influence over countries' domestic politics can only go this far. It's often exaggerated. So to give you an example, when Mr. Khan's government was ousted through a vote of no confidence for months, almost a year, he cited that there was a U.S. Uh, in, uh, interference uh, and a conspiracy to remove him from power. And part of that was, uh, you know, his uh, uh, supporters cited that he had visited Russia the day Russia, uh, incidentally, uh, and I'm quite sure Mr. Khan did not know that it was going to invade Ukraine the same day. And that, that obviously put Pakistan into a very embarrassing situation vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And then there was a leaked memo. Uh, you know, uh, between a State Department official and the Pakistani ambassador for private conversation in which some, I mean, there was no cons conspiracy to remove the government, but certainly the United States uh, administration, uh, administration ostensibly or reportedly, if, if that memo which has come into public light is correct, which says that the U.S. government was not too happy with that government. Now, not being happy and causing a regime change or a coup d'etat in a particular country are two different things. So I think ultimately the Pakistani diaspora has enough cloud linkages and they're doing a, a great job by uh, pushing for uh, observance of human rights, etc. Uh, ultimately, it has to change within the country, within the domestic 
And I would urge some of them to also advise, especially the supporters of Mr. Khan, to advise him to find a way to talk to his to other politicians. Because Mr. Khan consistently says that he's not going to talk to other politicians because they're corrupt and they are uh, compromised, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, and he's only going to talk to the military directly. Now, that, that may be so because military wields power and the state. But what I mentioned earlier in my remarks, that if you want to build a political consensus and bring some real change, you have to work with other political and civilian forces. Okay. Uh, I was going to read out a couple of questions on uh, the freedom of expression and uh, media regulation. Now, what role do media regulations play in shaping freedom of expression in Pakistan? What do social media platforms operate in the current uh, landscape? How does the government respond to online content and social media posts? And then um, what strategies do civil society groups employ to challenge these limits on freedom of expression? So I think I briefly uh, mentioned uh, the uh, internet controls, the reports of a firewall being installed and the restriction of um, X, uh, the, 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 the platform. And uh, that has already created a very uh, difficult situation for citizen journalists and average Pakistanis who interact and hear uh, and get information from social media. Now, the problem with social media is twofold. One is that it is a great um, opening and uh, a great way for people to engage and, and learn and know what is happening. But unfortunately, it has also become a source of disinformation, uh, a source of misinformation, and not just in Pakistan, in India, in Brazil, in the United States, you know, we know all the Congress congressional hearings that were done with Meta, uh, where the founder of Meta was questioned by, uh, you know, the Congress persons and 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 the Congress for hours and days and days, right? And with such issues as to how uh, the allegations of electoral manipulation uh, and other uh, stuff were were leveled. Similarly, we know that the Congress has passed a resolution on TikTok here in the United States saying that, that that TikTok should change its ownership. And I just heard that the, I mean, I just read the day before that the founder and CEO of Telegram, this other social platform was arrested in France. Now, France, US, and in the UK, in the recent riots, just two, three days ago, uh, you know, I, I mean, a few weeks ago, uh, courts have imposed harsh sentences on people who shared uh, 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 not just false news, but also who urged violence like burn down all mosques or kill all Muslims and stuff like that. Uh, you know, they have given, they've sentenced them. Now, obviously in Pakistan, no such, uh, uh, you know, legal environment has evolved because the state always misuses uh, this, this thing of uh, social control and harmony and peace in its favor as they're doing to basically muzzle PTI voices, right? So the current efforts in Pakistan are not to uh, create a better social media environment or to have a, a more uh, socially harmonious, uh, uh, you know, uh, landscape, but it is mainly to uh, uh, crush dissent, especially by the PTI. So I think that is what something, we, that is what needs to be, uh, done in Pakistan is that more and more civil society groups and politicians, the parliamentarians, have to stand up for the rights of the people. I'll stop it. Tarek, if I could just add one piece no to it. I think no one of the, yeah, I would say that one of the um, strategies, and you mentioned what strategies can be done by NGOs and CSOs to sort of combat the restricting space online. I think one of the issues that really comes up is that the devil really is in the details here, right? So I think the regulatory frameworks that have been established, by the way, both in India and in Pakistan, there's eerily similar when it comes to the invocation of national peace and harmony in order to shut down the internet or in, in order to shut down certain websites. India does a lot more of full-on internet shutdowns of the whole area rather than just specific sites. Pakistan has done YouTube in the past. It's done X now. Um, but I think one of the strateg strategies that's been particularly effective um, in litigation by CSOs and NGOs who are fighting against this is to really go into the depths of what and how judicial independence and 
oversight by judicial authorities in the process of making these decisions, whether it's to cut off sites, whether it's to deplatform individuals, whether it's to cut off the internet completely, are so important, right? So I think a lot of CSOs and NGOs focus on the big picture of like, how does this impact the constitutional right to freedom of expression and freedom of speech? That's very important. But I think particularly where it's effective is that when you go into the regulatory framework and you find that there's one or two offices that are not even elected offices, they're sort of like cabinet level, right, or like um, bureaucratic sort of level offices that are making the final decision on deplatforming, on um, removing a site from access in, on the internet or from shutting down the internet, what you really need there is judicial oversight. And that's where I think it's been effective in the past. In India, there's been a seminal decision on this issue on internet shutdowns, which was really more about the process that's supposed to be followed and the ability for the judiciary to have an oversight where they had an actual change in the way the policy was being done. Outside of that, I think it's very hard uh, to be able to confront uh, these kinds of limitations and issues. And one other uh, sort of just unrelated topic, but something that was mentioned in the chat, which is the correction on who was a lead petitioner in the removal of Nawaz Sharif. The case was the Panama Papers. The case was called Imran Khan versus Nawaz Sharif. So that was a lead petitioner in that case, which led to the disqualification of uh, the then prime minister. Just wanted to do a correction of the correction that was in the in the chat. Thank you so much, Faris. So uh, we 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 have about five minutes left. So I do want to. We, we're getting a, a few questions on religious freedom issues. So I do want to uh, cover that a little bit. Um, now, um, one of the main roots of of intolerance in Pakistani society is the draconian blasphemy law and the various anti md provisions within the Penal Code. Uh, there seems to be like a societal, religious, and political consensus that prevents any repeal or reform of these laws, uh, even the discussion of a reform and repeal appears to be taboo. Um, how do we get beyond this blockage? What's preventing this free discussion of reform? What steps can be taken to allow this uh, discussion of reform to take place um, uh, in Pakistan? <laughs> Well, Tarek, you've come yeah. up with the most <laughs> questions. <laughs> so, I mean, look, there have been efforts. So the last effort that was done uh, uh, by, I mean, that was an attempt was made in 20, uh, uh, you know, in, in the parliament uh, that was there from 2008 to 2013, you know, uh, the Minister for Minorities, who was a Christian, uh, Shabazz Bhatti, was gunned down. Uh, the governor of the Punjab province, Salman Tasir, was also shot down by one, his, one of his guards. And all he did was, all he did was, he asked for the reform. He did not even say repeal. He said, let's review this law. It's being abused because there was a Christian woman, Asya Bibi, who's now out of the country, uh, you know, and uh, he was handling her case and he was shot down. Since then, for a decade, no such move ever came to light. So the courts tried to, I mean, in recent uh, months, courts tried to sort of indirectly come in and say, well, you know, this draconian blasphemy law, uh, its its application must not uh, apply to, let's say, the rights of the Ahmadi community where they can practice their faith in private spaces, in their homes, in their mosques, or whatever. They, and even that right is being, uh, is, is being uh, uh, you know, challenged and uh, taken away. And I think so what is required is, once again, I would say it has to come through a consensus within the politicians and the parliament. You know, what has also happened is that political parties throughout Pakistan's history and the current ones are no exception, you know, including the Pakistan Tariq and Saf and including the uh, Pakistan Muslim League Noon uh, uh, and the Pakistan People's Party that actually brought in the Second Amendment in 1974 to declare Ahmadis as non-Muslims. The only, I think the only incident in world history where a parliament actually decides the fate of people. I mean, you haven't, you won't find a parallel in modern history. So, I mean, they really have to stop misusing religion for political gains. And that has to uh, stop. I mean, that's the first, that would be the first step. I mean, and then th there could be some debate and some discussion on how to stop uh, the abuse of this law and perhaps review its draconian uh, clauses and then hope that in, in the long term when, you know, 
uh, it it can go off the books. Uh, I didn't think I would, I was gonna, the only thing I would add here is that I think for, I mean, the court has enough jurisprudence, right, and enough constitutional principles where just because of the consistent misuse, right, and, and abuse of these laws against people who have not committed the underlying acts but are just sort of maybe have access to land, access to other things that other people just want to take in some ways, right? A lot of these, by the way, are land or rent uh, renter slash landlord disputes, right? The basic elements of what's happening here are actually very different from what the religious sort of sort of center is saying. I do think that what Reza is saying is very important, but I, I would add one caveat that if the politicians and the military, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank right. You. We're, we're to come to a, an agreement to say, okay, we will, okay, let's say that the parliament doesn't want to do it. We'll allow the, or we'll facilitate and let the court know through our back channels of communication that we will support a decision, whatever one you take in this, in this regard, right, to push the needle on this, whether it's overruling and calling for a repeal or actually just determining that it's ultra virus, right, a, a, an implicit violation of the of the Constitution to have these laws on the books, that would take away some of the pressure from Parliament to have to do it themselves. They could just sort of leave it that way. But it would require a sea change of all of these stakeholders who have in the past not been willing to take on sort of the religious right wing in many different ways, politicians and the establishment, um, and then them saying that we support the court sufficiently enough that they feel, you know, supported enough that if they make a decision that their own lives and their own livelihoods won't be at threat, because they're human beings, judges, just like everyone else, right? They have to live in this country. Uh, but if they make a decision that's not supported by these institutions, whether it's politicians and an establishment, they can't feel as if they're going to be safe in the society at large. They may themselves be accused of blasphemy just based on how we've seen this play out in history. So I think if there was a confluence of all of these institutions, um, we could actually see progress on this, but we haven't seen that because we haven't seen that confluence happen yet. And unless and until that happens, I just highly doubt that it's a, we're going to be able to move the needle on this one way or the other. One thing I do want to mention, uh, and it's a question uh, from the audience, so I do want to bring it up. What, in terms of this evolving of, uh, of, of blasphemy politics in the more recent years, um, what role has the Tehrik al Pakistan played in, in, this, in this matter? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, Tariq al uh, Pakistan is the most recent, I mean, it's, it's the new kid on the block. I'm mean, sorry to use this uh, colloquialism, but I mean, so all the, all the other religious extremists uh, and the bigots, you know, they have now found a kind of a mass uh, support in the form of this organization uh, that uh, came, I mean, uh, that came in uh, public light in 2017 and early 2018. And as uh, Varis mentioned, the role of the military, unfortunately, uh, the then ISI and the military leadership were directly involved in launching uh, this particular group for political ends. And uh, now they, and then during Imran Khan's tenure, twice they, they created uh, disruption. Uh, you know, they protested, there were clashes with the police, many policemen lost their lives. They burned down public uh, buildings, they threatened, and most recently they've been threatening the Chief Justice of Pakistan, the incumbent. They have basically, one of their leaders put, a, a, you know, a head money on uh, and said that, you know, uh, he would pay anyone who goes and kills the chief justice of Pakistan. Now, this is Pakistan's one of the top most offices. Imagine the kind of environment uh, that this group is. And, and the state, unfortunately, has been unable to grapple with this with this challenge. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, they if, under Imran Khan's government, they tried to ban the TLP. They passed, uh, you know, uh, to be fair, and to give credit to Imran Khan's administration, they try, you know, and, and to Imran Khan himself, you know, they tried to do something about it. But the political environment is such that, you know, then then the the opponents of a particular political party want to use the blasphemy card, religious card against them, just as the supporters of Imran Khan used that in 2018 elections. Uh, you know, so it's a... As I said, so that's why Varis, I was saying that, you know, the first step is, you know, whatever the military does, the military has to be pushed back into barracks. 
There's no question about that, whether it's for po uh, for political stability, for human rights, for uh, curbing extremism, and to and to give uh, Pakistanis their full citizenship rights. That's a standard starting point. But they also have to uh, agree that they're not going to use, uh, you know, uh, uh, these uh, religious. Uh, uh, edicts against opponents. Now, one of the cases that Imran Khan, you know, a ridiculous case was made against him that he married his current wife against the so-called Sharia injunctions. Of course, the courts ultimately threw it out, but he was convicted just before the election, rushed conviction, and the, and the strangest of cases, you know, uh, and obviously that created a lot of public anger on that. But so once again, the establishment and Imran Khan's political opponents were using religious uh, card against him. And that has to stop, you know. Well, thank you to you both. Uh, we've gone a little over, but it's been a wonderful discussion. Uh, this brings our program to an end. I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to the Tom Lantos Commission for organizing this vital briefing and to our distinguished panelists uh, for their very insightful contributions. And of course, to our online audience uh, for your active participation. Um, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.